talk, so it's great to have all of you here today. I know we've got a lot of returning faces and a lot of new faces as well. So welcome to the Cumberland River Compact. Uh, the mission of our organization is to en enhance the health and enjoyment of the Cumberland River and its tributaries through education, collaboration, and action. And River Talks is one of our main uh, community education programs where we bring folks together to talk about different issues in our area. Um, so we do hope that you can join us for our few remaining River Talks this season. Um, next week we have the Hidden Rivers Film Screening, which is going to be hosted at Montgomery Bell Academy. At, um, doors open at 6 p.m. The film will start at 6.30. So if you come here at noon, there's, there's not going to be anything. So make sure you check your calendar uh, before that. So um, that's going to be a new documentary focused on the biodiversity of the southeastern streams and rivers. So we're really excited to host the Nashville premiere of that. It's actually premiering, I believe, today at the Tennessee Aquarium before it comes to us next week. If you haven't already, be sure to join us as a member for this season. We have a lot of events coming up, and your membership does help support us in those different events. We've got six weekends of river cleanups starting this weekend as our first one. We're going all the way through April into May with weekend cleanups. We have our few final tree plantings of the season, and we're in high gear with our Creek Critters programs in 12 elementary schools and more. So to, for today's River Talk, um, it really highlights an opportunity and um, focus of the compact and of our River Talks, which is to bring people together to discuss ideas and learn from each other. The compact strives to bring all the voices to the table to enact change for our environment and our water. Today's talk showcases how collaborations between nonprofits and businesses can lead to some of the largest strides forward. Today we will hear the untold story of Bridgestone Nature Reserve at Chestnut Mountain. We are joined today by Terry Cook, he is the state director for the Tennessee for the Nature Conservancy of Tennessee. He heads a statewide team of scientists, conservation experts, and support staff whose work is to protect the integrity of Tennessee's biological rich landscapes. Current priorities of the Nature Conservancy are three prompt: protect, protect, transform, and inspire. By protecting critical lands and waters, they ensure a healthy future for people and nature. By transforming the way businesses, governments, and Tennesseans value nature they catalyze the change necessary for people and nature to thrive. And by inspiring a broader support for conservation, they ensure the willingness of future generations to act. He is joined today by Jim Moy. Jim is the Vice President of Environmental, Health, Safety, and Sustainability for Bridgestone Americas. In his current role, Demoy provides environmental health, safety, and sustainability strategic operation and operational leadership for Bridgestone, including more than 50 manufacturing facilities and 2,500 retail and service centers as part of Bridgestone America's retail operations network throughout both North and South America, and selects global operations, including the world's largest rubber factory located in Liberia. Under Des Moines' leadership, Bridgestone aims to further strengthen and accelerate its already robust programs under the umbrella of Bridgestone's Our Way to Serve Global Framework. He earned his Bachelor of Science degree in Geology from Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and a Master of Science in Civil Engineering degree and an MBA in International Business from Florida State University in Tallahassee. So please join me in welcoming both Jim and Terry, and we will get started with today's talk. So a good introduction there. How's my sound quality? Can everybody hear me okay? Too loud? Okay, good. 
nice introduction that kind of sets the stage for our talk with uh, me and Terry here going forward. Let's let this pull forward. I am Jim Demuy, and just a little bit about myself. You heard about my biography and my education and stuff, but I am also an avid outdoors person. Uh, this is, see, that's my son here taking the Falls Creek Falls of a year or two ago. He's now about to go to college, so he's a little bit bigger than that picture. Um, again, me at Falls Creek Falls, and, uh, and me then cleaning up some rivers, something that Ridgestone takes very serious. We do a lot of tire cleanups and river cleanups around the world. So. I uh, just wanted to point out that I'm very active in the outdoors environment and take this stuff really seriously on a personal level. A little bit about Bridgestone, setting the stage a little bit more, and I'm going I'm to um, a little bit, uh, just talking about our priorities at Bridgestone. So uh, I know everyone's familiar with the company. You see some of the things we do, but it's, it's rooted in what we, our institution, if you will. We have several priorities around what we call our way to serve, one of which is the environment. Um, among others like mobility and people and some other things. And the environment brings down to three typical prongs uh, in harmony with nature, which focuses around biodiversity, which is the subject of today's talk. Value in natural resources, this comes down to more our manufacturing, you know, how our waste is generated and stuff like that. We have a great story to tell there, not for today, for another time. And then we also focus around uh, climate change and reducing CO2 emissions, and we also have a big story to tell about that for another day, maybe. But speaking to our subject today, uh, beyond Chestnut Mountain and in harmony with nature, we still do many other things. We have 13 wildlife, certified wildlife habitat sites in the United States uh, that we advocate for. That's pollinated gardens, uh, all those type of activities that we do there. We're active supporters in the tree plantings that go on around here in, in Nashville and around Tennessee and around the United States. And we also really introduce some of this into the actual curriculums of uh, schools down in our Warren campus, County facility, we actually bring the students in as a part of the normal curriculum for the county. So far, 20,000 students have been through, and we educate them on uh, biodiversity and other environmental aspects. So trying to get the kids when they're young. So we do a lot of different things beyond the subject of today's talk. Just in that one pillar, I wanted to bring to your attention. Of course, you got a picture of Chestnut Mountain down here at the bottom. So let's get to today's talk. It's about Chestnut Mountain, and just to orientate you where that is, uh, we call it Chestnut Mountain. It's now called the Bridgestone Nature Reserve at Chestnut Mountain, but we for years called it just Chestnut Mountain inside of our company. This orientates you. It's about halfway between Nashville and Knoxville. It has a lot of connectivity to other parks around Falls Creek Falls area in that uh, Virgin Falls and in that locality. A little bit about the history about it. So going back sometime before I actually worked for Bridgestone, of course, it was Firestone. And one of the firestones came down to this area of the country, started accumulating land in that particular area, and we ended up accumulating around 16,000 acres uh, in the early 70s. And the original intention for the property at that time, and you think back how corporations were a few years ago, we had golf courses on our, on our manufacturing facilities, there's all kinds of things that the companies did as part of the social expectation of a company. So what the original plan was, was this was going to be a retreat for Firestone employees. So they bought this beautiful land, it's just truly beautiful when you get out there. And the idea was that they were gonna have a, a whole community, including you know, what I call uh, ski lifts, or gondolas, to get from peak to peak. There was gonna be a big resort center. Uh, there was gonna be a wildlife trail type of thing. Jack Nichols was actually, had, we actually had the design plans for the golf course. All of those type of things. It was really going to be this really beautiful retreat. But it turns out that's the way corporations have turned. So over time, that was not the decision anymore. So we, they decided not to, we decided not to do that as Firestone. Then along came Bridgestone and bought the property. And we said, well, we have this large, beautiful property. What are we going to do with it? And so we looked back at our mission statements and such, and we said, well, what we need to do is we need to enhance and improve the biodiversity out there. So for a long time, we were the stewards of the property. And there's some great old anecdotal stories out there. We hired a guy named Billy Bryant. I don't know if anybody knows Billy in the room. And he was the single curate, you know, ranger, I guess is the title we had, for the property for all 16,000 acres until last year. So from the early 70s until last year, he was the only person that was really allowed on the property for all this time. And he would do all kinds of crazy. He'd run off, you know, Unfortunately, the meth labs that would try to be set up in that part of Tennessee, you know, all the crazy stuff. Uh, he actually did rescues at 
Virgin Falls, because we have an access from our property over the top of Virgin Falls. People would get lost and couldn't get out. Uh, it's just on and on. He's an institution in that county and really a great guy. But uh, we're happy that he retired uh, gracefully as part of the property after many years of service in Bridgestone. But if, if you ever get out there, his name will come up quite a bit. Um, so we did a lot of stuff there and we started thinking further, what can we do you know, inside the company? And about that time, oh, here's a picture of it. So this is kind of a you know, drawn up one. You have the residential areas over here, the golf resort, the wilderness spa, the farm center, the village center, you know, the resort. So there's some crude drawings, but then there's some much more uh, refined drawings as well uh, going out there. So I imagine that kind of development in that part of the Tennessee right now. Some of this and stuff would be a little bit uh, out of character. Okay, so along we went, and then in, in the early, uh, so what was the date, Dane? 2014 it was. Uh, Dane works for me here, one of my teammates. In 2014, uh, we, we came across a TNC, and they approached us about shortly pine restoration. And from that little start, we big things. So we, we started working with TNC uh, to clear areas, you know, and it'll get terribly a little more into the, this problem, but we started to clear areas and actually replant something that's gone away in that area of the country in Tennessee. Further, we started getting forest certifications. We started working with them on the planning, how we can you know, enhance the rest of the forest, and our, our relationship just grew and grew and grew from this small inquiry, relatively, from the nature, from TNC to promote shortleaf pine restoration. And so with that, I'm going to let Terry come up and talk a little bit about from his side from the Nature Conservancy. Thanks, sir. Mm -hmm. um, again, my name is Terry Cook with the Nature Conservancy. And um, I'm going to kind of back up a little bit um, in terms of make sure you, you know who TNC is. And I imagine many of you here are members of the Nature Conservancy. Um, I've got a couple staff over here on the side. Um, so they had to come out. They didn't have a choice. So, uh, uh, my wife, Laura uh, Cook, is here as well. She works at Warner Park. So I think we set a new record. We're the only probably husband-wife team that's actually done river talks um, in the same year. Um, so she did a talk. Many of you may have heard a few weeks ago on bird migration, which was great, though she didn't let me attend. Um, but she is here today. Um, so anyway, so the Nature Conservancy, many of you probably are members, but we are the largest environmental conservation organization in the world. Um, we have 4,000 staff members. We have over a million members. And so thank you if you are a member. We work in 72 countries and we have chapters in all 50 states. Um, we have been around since the 1950s um, in terms of when TNC was founded and we were founded by a group of scientists. Um, and so we always talk about we're sort of a nonpartisan group in science space. And we're science based because that's how we're founded. When I came up through TNC, and I've been with TNC for 25 years, I started off as a field biologist. Started off on the science part of it and continued working in TNC sort of in that realm for many, many years and still like to pretend I am occasionally. But we're a big organization, we're an effective organization. And in Tennessee, we've been in Tennessee for now 40 years. Our 40th year anniversary was December of 2018, and during those 40 years, we've been able to protect 340,000 acres in Tennessee alone, and worldwide about 100. So we're proud of that, that work, and so that has been sort of the bread and butter of our work is land protection. Started off as a land trust, actually, in New York. Um, so the mission, many of you will be familiar with it, but is really to protect the lands and waters on which all life depends. And our mission has actually changed over time. If you go back in the history of the Nature Conservancy, at one time we were focused on protecting living museums, right? We were focused on where are the rare species that we can protect, and we'll start protecting these small postage stamps and these living museums of rarity. And increasingly, as the science has progressed in sort of conservation biology, our approach has changed as well. And so the vision of the Nature Conservancy now really incorporates not only the, the idea of nature, but the idea of people. Instead of protecting nature from people, it is really protecting nature 
four people and realize the two are closely linked. So a couple of our priorities that we're working on, and this is whether globally or locally, things that we're working on, one is tackling climate change. Um, the second is protecting land and water. That's sort of core to the heart of who TNT is and how we started. Providing food and water sustainably, as well as building healthy cities. And so a couple of these areas may be new in terms of how you think about TNC, but really we started to think about what are the global environmental challenges and what are the solutions to those challenges and realize we can't buy everything that's out there and we can't set aside everything that's out there. We really got to approach our work in a different way. So the tackling climate change and protecting land and water really connects closely with our work with Bridgestone in terms of thinking about forest protection, thinking about climate change, thinking about offsets. So I'm going to talk about that just a little bit. So we're science-based. Um, so the reason why we started to reach out to Bridgestone is because the science told us we should, um, believe it or not. So if you go on the web, if you're interested in terms of how conservation lands can support sort of resilient landscapes, and where those occur within Tennessee. We've actually done a couple of reports. Down at the bottom here says, uh, um, uh, is a website, conservationgateway.org. That is a really a science website for TNC. And we've actually developed and mapped the most resilient landscapes across the eastern US, including Tennessee. And so those reports give you, not only can you download the data, but you can start thinking about sort of biodiversity and climate and how those work together. What we did here in Tennessee is actually apply that information to the development of state wildlife action plan. Every wildlife agency, every state is required to develop a state wildlife action plan. Um, to how does the state approach the conservation of species of greatest concern to the state? And in order for the state to receive federal funding, they have to develop the plan. So the Nature Conservancy essentially developed that plan with TWRA, taking our resiliency science and biodiversity information and putting a plan together. And again, that information is available to anybody in this room. It's at tnswap.org. So if you're interested at all of reading about this information, sort of exploring places around you to see how they match up to sort of the data that we have, these are great resources. And I really, you know, the value of this work that we do is not so much how we use it, but how people use it when we're not around. So I really encourage people to access it. To, if you're working with a local conservation group, if you're working with a statewide group, if you're working with your town or your county, and they're interested in what are important areas around you, um, these are really good resources and guides to that. But they were really good resources and guides for us as we thought about where do we go in the states. So where are those areas from a biodiversity standpoint really stand out? Where are those landscapes and forests that are climate resilient and it's part of a larger connected network? Um, and again, you've seen this map, the larger one with the orange, that is the Bridgestone Nature Reserve at Chestnut Mountain. And you can see it's highly connected to a lot of other public land that's out there. This is. I kind of, when I look at that, I think of it as the crown, the jewel on top of the crown, right? This is one of the pieces that Bridgestone originally kept. Um, and if you look at our data, and the red really highlights the hot spot, when we started looking at our data, it really said this is an area that's really important. A hundred species of conservation concern sort of make their home sort of on this property and the lands around it. Uh, we knew from a climate standpoint it was highly resilient as well and connected to other protected areas. So that's when we started knocking on the door and said, how can we work together? You know, the science brings us here um, and we want to create a partnership. Working with corporations from an environmental standpoint, there are a lot of pluses to do that especially when you look at the underlying goals from a corporate sustainability standpoint, do they match up with the Nature Conservancy? Is this a partnership that we feel is successful? Do we have the same types of values of which really would set us up for potential success for working together? So those are the types of things. When we work with corporations, we go through 
one committee and another committee and another committee to look at potential conflicts of interest between working with a for-profit company and working with the Nature Conservancy. And as much as Bridgestone values their brand in terms of a company of integrity, one of the most important things that the Nature Conservancy has is our brand as well, making sure that we work with integrity. Uh, we're not here to greenwash corporations. We're here to try to achieve conservation success. So choosing and choosing a corporate partner is really a tricky business, um, but one that we're really proud of in terms of the work that we're doing with Bridgestone. So part of this was about areas important for conservation, but part of this is about climate as well. So are the forests globally hold um, as much or more carbon in the forest than we have in the atmosphere, right? We refer to nature as the forgotten solution um, because nature can mitigate climate change. Nature can absorb the CO2 that's being emitted. It's a powerful force of which oftentimes we think about how do we, how do we reduce the energy consumption in our home? How do we reduce of tri travel and fossil fuel consumption, but nature provides a great solution as well. A recent study by the Nature Conservancy and its scientific partners reveals that we have been underestimating the power of nature to help tackle climate change. The study looks at 20 different types of management strategies or natural climate solutions across forests, Grasslands and agricultural lands and wetlands, and quantifies the greenhouse gas emissions mitigation potential of each one. The white bar represents the maximum mitigation potential. The light gray bar represents the mitigation we need to keep global warming under 2 degrees Celsius above pre industrial levels. The dark gray bar represents the mitigation that can be achieved for less than $10 per ton. The study points toward the most promising opportunities for increased investment in natural climate solutions. Implementing all of these pathways could provide 37% of the solution to stabilizing our climate by 2030. The study also demonstrated a multitude of additional benefits, including clear air, improved soil quality, increased biodiversity, and secure clean supplies of water. If we're going to tackle the challenge of climate change, We'll need nature's help. So again, it gives you just a little insight. A third of the solution to climate change is actually incorporated into nature. Sort of managing, making sure we don't deforest our landscapes, making sure we manage those forests appropriately, make sure we have soil management and crop management in a way that sequesters more carbon than it actually releases. Again, climate and biodiversity are linked, right? So as climate warms, huge impact on biodiversity. As we degrade our ecosystems and our forests, it really undermines their ability to sequester CO2. And so those, as we think about our bridge zone, we started really saying hotspot for biodiversity, but managing the forest and sequestering carbon is part of the solution as we address climate. And as we think about parks and we think about open spaces and we think about our national forests and we think about that, oftentimes we approach it from we need more access to green space, we need to protect habitats and wildlife, we need to have clean water, but also make sure it's part of the discussion is this is part of the solution for climate. Do not lose that as a really important part of being become an advocate for nature. So one of the things that we're doing, 83% of Tennessee's forest are privately owned, right? So we're not going to go out and buy all that. But can we help private forests better, manage them in a way that actually address climate and biodiversity? So we've developed a working woodlands program, right? How do we sustain jobs? How do we manage forests better? How do we sequester more climate? How do we generate more revenue for that line owner to be able to manage that force better? One of the things that we went to Bridgestone after we started the shortleaf pine, it says, we've got this model. As we're developing the force management plan, we'd love to enroll this in FSC, Forest Stewardship Council Certification, the gold standard of force management in terms of sustainability. 
So that was something we put on the table. That was something that Bridgestone said, let's do that. We said, we've got this other idea, is that we could actually inventory the force and calculate how much carbon it sequesters, how much it holds in its trees and its roots. And we can actually sell that and generate a revenue stream for Bridgestone in terms of being able to manage this property in a new way and in a better way that addresses climate. So we put that proposal out to Bridgestone and really we sat for weeks, sometimes it seems like months, sort of every once in a while, emailing and said, what do you think about that proposal? I was actually driving back from Memphis with a couple of staff and uh, Dane, you or Jim, you said, let's do this conference call. Um, it's the only time in recent memory where I almost went in the ditch. Um, they said, listen, we looked at your proposal, we've talked about it internally, it's a great idea, um, but we're not doing the working woodlands, we're not doing the carbon work. We've got a second proposal for you. Why don't we give you the property and you guys do the carbon? You help us offset our carbon, uh, do carbon offsets for our new headquarters downtown Nashville, and you take that revenue and you put it back in Chestnut Nashville for all Tennesseans to maximize the biodiversity, the habitat, um, and that is the approach um, that we started down after that conversation. So internally, how did we get to that phone call inside? So uh, interesting, that's why it took so long probably to get back with you on some of those calls. So I, I dropped in, I parachuted in about three and a half years ago to reach out to a different company. And one of the first things my boss came to me and said, well, we have this property out there. What can we do with it? What, what should we do with it? And uh, so I, I, I did some research on what we had been doing. I already went through our history and stewardship of the property, heard some from Terry as well. Started dialoguing it with, with the team inside. And, and we came to the realization and the understanding that We've been doing great things with the property, but it's, no one can see it. No one can enjoy it. And is that really what we should be doing? You know, are we the best experts at that? Or can we turn it over to someone else and still accomplish all our objectives that we're trying to do with the property, but even enhance it so more people can use it and more people can see it? So it's a really interesting discussion inside of the, uh, I'm, I'm gonna go back to that slide here and come to this one. So the way I approached it with my leadership is I said, well, let's, let's look at the value proposition all the way around. I think you could obviously see if we just sold the property, we could make a lot of money, right? Obviously, it's a beautiful property. But that's not the first approach we took. That's only one piece of valuation, the way I presented it. The other piece was the story, the, the leadership aspects that we, could, that we could do as a company in demonstrating the Working Woodlands Program, and demonstrating to other corporations what you can do with land, how it can self-fund, yet still help with the carbon offsets and maybe your corporate goals like we have. Many, many different ways we approached it from, from that. And, and some, of the, some of the how we did here inside of the company is it really required, I guess if you, if you ever have to do this inside a company, the first thing is the company has to have a predisposition to want to do this. If, they're just, if it's just a, what I'll call a cash cow approach of a company where you're just trying to monetarily make money, you're never going to get it across to the starting line. But as I indicated, we have, a, we have a predisposition to want to do these type of things. So uh, the audience was a little easier, and my leadership was great. But still, we had to have a really strong, functional team inside of our company to make this happen. There, if, as many committees as maybe TNC has, I guarantee we have twice as many inside of our company. And you, know, you got the finance side, you got the, you know, the tax side, you got the land side, you got the leadership, you got the on and on and on and on. Everybody has to get aligned. So everybody has to have a stake in the game. So if you ever get a chance to do this, it has to be a very large team, and everybody has to come together, meeting regularly, all the time, uh, to, to, to assure what's going on. And you really have to keep your eye on the big ball. Uh, because, and you have to have great partners. Not only was TNC, but we also had TDEC engaged as well uh, to help us out of some of the contractual stuff. So some of the learnings from it are, it's not easy to give something away. <laughs> I mean, really, take $5 and walk up to somebody and say, here's $5. What's the first reaction everybody has? <laughs> you know, what's, I mean, really, I, I was, it was, it, I mean, we had a lot of really great conversations 
you know, and, and you know, he has his committees, we had ours, ZDEC had their particular aspects. Um, I mentioned corporate culture is important for it to even get across the starting line. Deadlines are critically important. I set an artificial deadline, I actually had my CEO write it on his board in his office of when this had to happen by or it wasn't going to happen. Probably wasn't a real deadline. But I, I drove it as hard as I could with my team. I drove it hard with Terry, we we're going to meet this deadline. I drove with TDEC, we're going to meet this deadline, we're not going to do it. Right. So that kept everybody focused. So it's a lesson for everybody. Um, you have to have a really clear understanding of the final structure within a company to move forward. If you look at the way corporations really run, they run on op expense, not after-tax expense. So people are rewarded inside of a company in different ways. Different company structures set up differently. But when you give things away, the real return on it in a financial sense is after-tax, right? Because you get a tax write-off for something you donate, like when you go to Goodwill, right? But that doesn't play into most companies' way they measure their man. So you really have to understand that and how to work around it, right? And this one's kind of a comment, but you have to expect the knuckleball. Is anybody a baseball player in here? Anybody been a baseball player? What's a knuckleball? It's coming at you, you don't know where, you don't, you don't know what's coming next, you don't know what turn is coming next, right? And, and this is a little humorous, but our knuckleball was... <laughs> Time we were going through this, the elections were going on, and I, you know, I think you know, say no one expected Trump to win the election, right? But he won, so, so yeah, that's a knuckleball. So, but, right, but then, the, then the umpire called the play, or called his buddies, and, and he introduced the tax plan, right? And the tax plan, anybody remember what the tax plan does for a corporation? <laughs> Cuts the rate by a pretty large amount, right? Cuts the rate. Well, I thought I just mentioned about the financial side. It's the tax write-off, it's the return on the financial side, right? So any philanthropic people in here have to really recognize this now. Your, your ability to get money from a corporation or anyone yourself has significantly changed, right? So this happened right in the middle of our deal, right in the middle of the discussion we were having. So when I go back to the value proposition, one of the line items significantly changed, right? I mean, significantly changed. You talk about a property this big with this much value. Having said that, was the factor, but it wasn't the total value proposition. So we moved on. But everyone should be aware of that as you go forward. The second one was horses. Now, how can horses come into play? And Terry may want to comment on this one here in a minute too. We were at the last hour. Remember, I had my deadline. We had we had all this up in the top floor of Richmond Village, which is right over there, top floor boardroom meeting. Everybody T deck, all the lawyers' room was packed. Down to like four items. One's financial. Two were I knew we meeting, and one was. Equestrian use of the property. I'm thinking we're never going to get out of this room because the financial one's going to kill us, right? We're never going to get to who's going to pay to maintain this or whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, that took like five minutes to get through. <laughs> I'm like, man, we're, 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 we're on our way here, right? We're, we're done. So, so got and then we got to horses. And there's actually a good reason for this. But I didn't think about it. Nobody thought about it. So uh, the state, as part of the back, backstop of the deal, wanted to have a question, a single equestrian trail through the property for public access, right? I thought that was not a big deal. I was wrong. Because there is environmental concerns about a horse trail, there's security concerns about a horse trail. And more importantly, it was important to TNC because TNC, as I understand it at the time, didn't allow any equestrian use on their properties. It took a long time to get through that one, hours. And, and all with good reason, like everybody has been. So at the end of the day, I go back to my point I said earlier that everyone kept their eye on the end game and the ball at the end of the game. So everybody bent just enough, moved forward so we could actually make it happen. And I appreciate that. There's several room outside of the room, everybody goes out, gets to the lawyers, does this, does that, what's the language, and we got through. So these were the two, two quirk, quirks and knuckleballs that came up at the very last minute, at the very last hour. Let me see, where are we going? So now we, I think there's plans, and Terry will touch on this, we do actually have that trail in the future. So let's go back a couple of slides. And Terry, you can come up here and join me if you like on this particular piece. So going back to some of the things that we align on, and I want to touch on, Terry mentioned the, the uh, where is it, the property and the sequestration part, and I touched on it as well. This is a very important thing for corporations and for everyone, as he, as he mentioned. It is a funding source 
for properties, if you want to go approach that, you can, this whole endeavor will be self-funding from the property itself. And we had to think long and hard about the contractual terms, about how we make that happen, not contractual terms, the donation agreement. Because the other thing is, if you donate something with any actual teeth to the donation, then it's no longer a donation. So it's all suggestions, right? So we had to work very hard and collaboratively on this to have suggestions, but we were aligned, so it was easy. So we all wanted the carbon sequestration project to, to be successful, and we all wanted that to fund the property. We all wanted to have a, uh, a training session once a year out there, not training, but a, uh, here's what we're doing at the site. So we're going to invite everybody in, the county, the people, to see what's happening at the property. We all wanted those things. So we were really aligned on that. That's a really big thing going forward. You want to take one, Terry, or pick one? Yeah. So, so one of the things that allowed this to happen um, was a level of trust. Um, every time we got in the room, we started talking about and going down this blind alley and another blind alley. I kept coming back to this first one. This was sort of in the preamble to the agreement, right? Preserve the conservation values of Chestnut Mountain. That, to me, became the North Star. And I think with Bridgestone, that became the North Star. So how does that guide our conversations? And how does that guide the construction of a donation agreement and a management agreement and deed restrictions associated with the property that actually support that? And then these other ones all came in as well as sort of you know things that we would like to see but they were really guided with that first one. So whether we're talking about public access, whether we're talking about equestrian, whether we're talking about uh, you know, timbering on the property, whatever that was, it had to be done in the context of preserving or enhancing the conservation values of the property. So we did trip over the horse part of this. And, and to tell you the truth, we still haven't solved that issue. What we do know is that we started our conversations with TDEC, who's our neighbor and partner out there. And we said, how can we in this, you know, we're still, what, eight months into this donation? Right. Not really. um, we're still in the first year. So we're starting those conversations about how do we allow public access? How do we ensure that rescue operations out on the state natural area in Virgin Falls happen unimpeded? How do we all of a sudden look at this property independent of who owns it and what is the best use of this resource given all the other state natural areas out there. So that's the conversation that's taking place. How do we look at this whole collection, this whole mosaic of natural areas, and how do we manage and use those for public access or conservation together in a way that has really been done property by property by property, but not by a landscape approach that is really independent of who owns it even though each of us has our guiding principles. So that's one of the things that we're working on and one of the challenges of this. But at the same time, because we've worked with TDEC for decades, there's a level of trust that we're all still trying to figure out how can we do all this and still preserve and enhance the ecological values of the projects collectively. And on a, on a more kind of uh, good points here, and on a more uh, kind of funny inside the Behind the cur behind the door type conversations, it's kind of like doing your. It has to be a prenup, or it's kind of like doing the, maybe it's your will. You, know, you get into these long, drawn out conversations about things you think will never happen. You know, okay, what if the first level fails and the second level fails and the third level fails? And how do you put language in there? And none of us are going to be around if any of this happens anyway. You know, down the road. So it gets it got really uh, really interesting and from that kind of comical side in my view, but with all the lawyers in the room and everything else, you have to be there with those terms exactly right. That took a lot of time and and uh, and I think the trust part you, you mentioned got us through all of that. So um, so moving forward. So we had it actually happened. We've actually donated the property. Um, on Earth Day it was a formal a formal day I guess it was, right? Out of, out of the property. Uh, so what are the results? On top of the 10,000 acres we gave to the state before we donated another 5,763 acres, uh, to be exact, uh, to TNC for future generations, the species protection there. Uh, the property is self-funding. Um, portion of that, the, the carbon offsets that aren't used to fund the property will offset our building over here, which we think will be the first carbon neutral building in Nashville. I'm not sure how fast that we can beat them to the solar that's coming on. I'm not sure. 
Uh, we hope so. Uh, we think it's a precedent, um, an example setting for other corporations to follow. Um, it was covered by a lot of media outlets around the world, actually. It's the largest land donation in, in your history, I believe, in Tennessee. Uh, and it'll have public access and connecting the 60,000 acres of, of property. So we had a big celebration and we're quite proud of, of what all happened. You can see of us, me and Terry speaking there out at the property as well. And then I gotta tell you, it rained and a thunderstorm came in. I was, I've never seen anything like it. I, was, I got way, far away from this rod as I could possibly get. In fact, I went, in fact, I went and got in my car. It was, it was thunderstorming so bad. Anyway, we had a great time. And with that, I'll talk, turn it over to Terry to talk about the future of the property. Yeah, so, so this doesn't happen very often, right? Where you almost get 6,000 acres handed to you. And besides that, you have an opportunity to self-fund it, right? I, I wish someone would do that with my house, but we're not there. So one of the things that we're working on, one is the donation agreement, has some deed restrictions to it, but that is a guiding principle of what we're doing. So right now we have, we're hiring staff. We have a forester that we're advertising for. We hope to bring them on soon. We started uh, conversations with universities. We'd love for this to be a platform for research about sustainability of our forest, about uh, climate smart forestry. Um, these are the headwaters uh, to the Cane Fort, uh, which feed into the Cumberland River, which flow right by us here. And so really thinking about the freshwater part of it, thinking about the forest restoration and the management of it, thinking about the carbon, but also things like the MODIS network, right? So this is something that would allow us to create the first MODIS tower, which really is an antenna system that tracks all kinds of species, bats, birds, dragonflies, large mammals, small mammals. So this is part of a network that if you're looking at our migratory species that may overwinter and sort of move up into Canada and the Arctic, you know, one of the great mysteries is how they conduct this migration. What's the survival route? How does that landscape influence them over the long term? And so along the coastlines, they put these, these basically receiving towers to pick up um, you know, sort of radio signals from these birds that have been tagged. Um, so actually with partnership with Warner Park, who really started to think about how to use Warner Park as a regional park, we said we should be putting one at Chestnut. We should make that the first modus tower in the state and really use Chestnut as a place to explore conservation, to engage people in conservation, and to learn not only why this property is important, but how it may be important from a really a hemispheric standpoint in terms of supporting a lot of migratory pathways that actually, as you can see, come right through Tennessee. And doing that in partnership with our universities, doing it in partnership with Metro Parks at Warner Park, for the first time really start collecting not only why is this important locally, but these areas like Warner Park and Chestnut play really larger regional and hemispheric importance in terms of science and conservation. Um, we are looking at youth groups. We have a youth group doing stewardship activities out this, there this summer. Um, we're looking at community days. We're increasing sort of trail development that will hook our property into the public around there. Meeting with the local chamber of commerce and say, how can we work with you to bring more ecotourism into this area? We don't want a property with a fence around it. We want a property that has a gate that invites people in. Um, but we've got to learn how to do that. And we have to learn how to do that is consistent with maintaining property without degrading those. And that goes to horseback riding as well. How do we work with TDEC that allows horseback riding on an adjacent property, and how do we allow access onto some of our roads so that they can enjoy um, the greater landscape and also hear the story about this unique piece of property. So I think with that, um, we'll go ahead and take a few questions. Yeah. Uh, Terry, it's, uh, you talked about restoring the shore leaf mine. Yeah. Obviously, it's Chestnut Mountain probably had chestnuts, which were eliminated by the light in the 30s. Are you looking at, once the, they think they're developing a light-resistant chestnut, restoring chestnuts to the area? 
So, so that's an interesting question because there's a chestnut oak as well. So there's chinquapin oak out there. So the question has come up how dominant was sort of American chestnut versus chestnut oak out there. We don't have a question. That is something that we sort of have on sort of the parking lot for us to think about in terms of are there opportunities. One, the property is really diverse. You've got that upland, Cumberland plateau, but you have deep ravines and gorges along the side around it. And so I think there is a lot of opportunity. The short leaf pine we really focused on because in Tennessee we probably lost 60 or 70 percent of short leaf pine habitat, which really was pretty dominant on the Cumberland Plateau. So as we started down the road, we started on that, but that certainly is not the whole story. And that is a question that we have. And hopefully we'll work with some of our academic partners to help us sort of narrow that down a little bit and what the opportunities are. Good question. to the deed that sort of point out what we do and, and can't do. 
there's also TDEX partnership in this is that they on an annual basis come in and make sure that we are adhering to the conditions of those restrictions in the deed and donation agreement. So there, there are multiple sort of layers of which have been put into the agreement uh, to ensure long term the property is managed well. Yeah, that was kind of that kind of green up discussion I was referring to. That took a lot of our negotiations and getting through, and how could we make all of that happen? Also, one other aspect I think on a positive side, we talked. You're going to have, I think, a, a, some call it a celebration out there once a year, where you invite everyone to come out here what they're doing at the property, at the property itself. So I think that's kind of a nice piece too. Yeah, you know, we've got a, every time I go out to the property. I learn more about the property, right? So we're sort of in uh, the honeymoon phase if um, we go with that pre net. So we are learning more from the environmental as well as the cultural. There is a human story out there as well that is fascinating. And so as we learn more for us in developing our management plans, we are land trust, we are accredited, we have standards. That's sort of the fifth layer is that as an accredited land trust, we also have certain conditions on us and how we do the management property so um, and then just working with our partners trying to be as transparent as possible inviting researchers and academics onto the property and learning from them too as we go forward so we think this is a great platform it is 90 minutes from Knoxville 90 minutes from Chattanooga 90 minutes from Nashville in an area that should really be promoting sort of conservation and thinking about it in a new way we hope it becomes a meeting ground for those types of discussions and we learn as we go Is it open to the public now? If we go, what can we do there? So it's not open to the public. We've had it about eight months. We're just now hiring staff. So we're working on the forest inventory plan. Um, we have completed the carbon work on that. So we've sold some carbon credit to establish an endowment. But even just sort of doing inventory and maintenance on the roads, those types of things. And then we've started in the last two weeks conversations with TDEC about providing access to the property we have no facilities on there, so what we're trying to do is use TDEX sort of points of entry onto the property as ways in which people will be able to get onto the property and explore it. So we're starting to map out the development of trails that would go from some of the state natural areas onto our property. But that's that in itself is a bit of a process to work through. So we hope in the next year some of those trails start to open up. Um, in the back first. From a historical perspective, North Tennessee is a grassland as it goes to the forest. Are you uh, going to make any attempt to restore the grassland there? So, yes. And, and actually, if you think about the short leaf pine, it was a short leaf pine savanna. Um, and so as we started to do some prescribed fire and some harvesting out there and replanting short leaf pine, we are actually starting to see some of the native grasslands sort of start to pop up in there um, because it hasn't been managed because a lot of the sort of natural fire that occur has been suppressed over you know, decades and decades. Um, you probably familiar with Dwayne Estes, who is leading the Southwest Southeast Grasslands Initiative. Dwayne has been out there as a partner of ours as well. So with some of the short leaf pine, we'll get some of that sort of natural recovery of some of those grasslands. I would also add on the adjacent property in the Firestone Firestone Centennial Wilderness, which is 10,000 acres, there's a large grassland that's uh, down there as well. They've done some initial activities on this property as well. So I think the short answer is yes. I always do more, of course. Other questions? There are other the large tracts of land we mentioned, like the uh, Aubrey Falls State Farm and Forest and the Scout Center and, and, and the Bourbon Falls. How much coordination are you carrying on, carrying on with those other landowners? Yeah, so um, so the, the Boy Scout reservations, we've been out and, and have actually met with them this past year to talk about forest management planning, carbon, a number of other things. So that conversation started. We're not sure where that will go. Um, we just had a meeting with uh, TWRA and TDEC probably two weeks ago. Um, and one of them was specifically about coordination of rescue operations to make sure everybody had access to every gate. And we sort of could do that. The second follow-up meeting we had with TDEC was start to plan for sort of co-management, trail development, and some of those sort 
sort of other things that we want to do that would provide that coordination. What would a greater partnership around sort of joint management of some of those properties? It might be prescribed fire, it might be inventory. Those are things that are sort of on the work plan to figure out where those opportunities are. Um, so we're aware there's great potential there. We're not sure what that's going to look like in the end, but that is part of the conversation. With, with the map you had earlier, um, Show us how it relates to, say, Scott's goal and some of these other things. That so that's so so um, that's Scott's goal right there. That that but photo. I'm talking about on the map. Yeah, just so people know who haven't been out there. So, so this is in the other Scott's goal. Yeah, this this area right here is Scott's goal. Yes. A lot of that property is actually part of state ownership. Some of it is now TNC's previous Bridgestone. Um, and then a the big chunk of that is looking for more property down Scott's Hall. I think you've got enough blue now. Yeah, let's see if I can pull it over. Uh, there you go. There you go. Oh, I saw There it is. There. Yeah. No, no. Look at that one up there. So this is Scott's Hall right through here. I thought they were joining. Yeah. That's what I wanted to see. Beautiful. Have you been out there? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely gorgeous. And did you have a question? Oh, sorry, you're in you. Covered. Covered. All right. Well, it's just just about one o'clock, so um, I do want to thank both Terry and Jim for coming. And we work, um, you know, as the compact, we work a lot with the Nature Conservancy. We do work with Bridgestone. Um, as I mentioned, we have those six street cleanups coming out, and we do pull the tires out. Those are one of the items that we find, and do recycle those, you know, with with Bridgestones. Yeah, can I ask that? So if you go yeah. to a community, you know, if you go to our website, uh, we will take the tires and dispose of them 100% uh, for its beneficial reuse. Yeah, so that's a great partnership, and we thank you for that. Um, so thank you guys again, and if you didn't get a chance, uh, we just have a little paper survey about River Talk, since this will be our final uh, River Talk here at the River Center. If you don't mind filling that out, we've got, um, you can turn it in up here as well if you haven't. So. Thank you. I do hope to see you guys um, next week or on our final two tours, but this will be our last River Talk here in River Center this year. So thank you guys. Thank you.